Chapter Four of Five Beloved Stories by O. Henry. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Man About Town. There were two or three things that I wanted to know. I do not care about a mystery, so I began to inquire. It took me two weeks to find out what women carry in dress suitcases, and then I began to ask why a mattress is made in two pieces. The serious query was at first received with suspicion because it sounded like a conundrum. I was at last assured that its double form of construction was designed to make lighter the burden of women who make up beds. I was so foolish as to persist, begging to know why, then, they were not made in two equal pieces, whereupon I was shunned. The third draft that I craved from the font of knowledge was enlightenment concerning the character known as a man about town. He was more vague in my mind than a type should be. We must have a concrete idea of anything, even if it be an imaginary idea, before we can comprehend it. Now I have a mental picture of John Doe that is as clear as a steel engraving. His eyes are weak blue, he wears a brown vest, and a shiny black serge coat. He stands always in the sunshine chewing something, and he keeps half shutting his pocket knife and opening it again with his thumb. And if the man higher up is ever found, take my assurance for it, he will be a large pale man with blue wristlets showing under his cuffs and he will be sitting to have his shoes polished within sound of a bowling alley, and there will be somewhere about him turquoises. But the canvas of my imagination, when it came to limning the man about town, was blank. I fancied that he had a detachable sneer, like the smile of the Cheshire Cat, and attached cuffs, and that was all. Whereupon I asked a newspaper reporter about him. Why? said he. A man about town, something between a rounder and a clubman. He isn't exactly, well, he fits in between Mrs. Fish's receptions and private boxing bouts. He doesn't, well, he doesn't belong either to the Lotto's Club or to the Jerry McGuigan Galvanized Iron Workers Apprentices Left Hook Chowder Association. I don't exactly know how to describe him to you. You'll see him everywhere there's anything doing. Yes, I suppose he's a type. Dress clothes every evening, knows the ropes, calls every policeman and waiter in town by their first names. No, he never travels with the hydrogen derivatives. You generally see him alone or with another man. My friend the reporter left me, and I wandered further afield. By this time the 3,126 electric lights on the Rialto were alight. People passed, but they held me not. Paythian eyes rayed upon me and left me unscathed. Diners, heimgangers, shop-girls, confidence men, panhandlers, actors, highwaymen, millionaires, and outlanders hurried, skipped, strolled, sneaked, swaggered, and scurried by me, but I took no note of them. I knew them all. I had read their hearts. They had served. I wanted my man about town. He was a type, and to drop him would be an error, a typograph, but no, let us continue. Let us continue with a moral digression. To see a family reading the Sunday papers gratifies. The sections have been separated. Papa is earnestly scanning the page that pictures the young lady exercising before an open window and bending. Uh, but there, there. Mama is interested in trying to guess the missing letters in the word N space W Y O space K. The oldest girls are eagerly pursuing the financial reports, for a certain young man remarked last Sunday night that he had taken a flyer in Q, X, and Z. Willie, the eighteen-year-old son, who attends the New York public school, is absorbed in the weekly article describing how to make over an old skirt, for he hopes to take a prize in sewing on graduation day. Grandma, 
is holding to the comic supplement with a two hours grip, and little Totty the baby is rocking along the best she can with the real estate transfers. This view is intended to be reassuring, for it is desirable that a few lines of this story be skipped, for it introduces strong drink. I went into a café to, and while it was being mixed, I asked the man who grabs up your hot scotch spoon as soon as you lay it down, what he understood by the term, epithet, description, designation, characterization, or appellation viz, a man about town. Why, said he carefully, it means a fly guy that's wise to the all-night push, see? It's a hot sport that you can't bump to the rail anywhere between the flat irons, see? I guess that's about what it means. I thanked him and departed. On the sidewalk, a salvation lassie shook her contribution receptacle gently against my waistcoat pocket. Would you mind telling me, I asked her, if you ever meet with the character commonly denominated as a man about town during your daily wanderings? I think I know whom you mean, she answered with a gentle smile. We see them in the same places night after night. They are the devil's bodyguard, and if the soldiers of any army are as faithful as they are, their commanders are well served. We go among them, diverting a few pennies from their wickedness to the Lord's service. She shook the box again, and I dropped the dime into it. In front of a glittering hotel, a friend of mine, a critic, was climbing from a cab. He seemed at leisure, and I put my question to him. He answered me conscientiously, as I was sure he would. "'There is a type of man about town in New York,' he answered. "'The term is quite familiar to me, but I don't think I was ever called upon to define the character before.' It would be difficult to point you out an exact specimen. I would say, offhand, that it is a man who had a hopeless case of the peculiar New York disease of wanting to see and know. At six o'clock, each day life begins with him. He follows rigidly the conventions of dress and manners, but in the business of poking his nose into places where he does not belong, he could give pointers to a civet cat or a jackdaw. He is the man who has chased Bohemia about the town, from Rathskeller to Roof Garden, and from Hester Street to Harlem, until you can't find a place in the city where they don't cut their spaghetti with a knife. Your man about town has done that. He is always on the scent of something new. He is curiosity, impudence, and omnipresence. Handsomes were made for him, and gold-banded cigars, and the curse of music at dinner. There are not so many of him, but his minority report is adopted everywhere. I'm glad you brought up the subject. I've felt the influence of this nocturnal blight upon our city, but I never thought to analyze it before. I can see now that your man about town should have been classified long ago. In his wake spring up wine agents and cloak models, and the orchestra plays Let's All Go Up to Maud's for him by request instead of Handel. He makes his rounds every evening, while you and I see the elephant once a week. When the cigar store is raided he winks at the officer familiar with his ground, and walks away immune while you and I search among the presidents for names and among the stars for addresses to give the desk sergeant. My friend the critic paused to acquire breath for fresh eloquence. I seized my advantage. You have classified him, I cried with joy. You have painted his portrait in the gallery of city types. But I must meet one face to face. I must study the man about town at first hand. Where shall I find him? How shall I know him? Without seeming to hear me, the critic went on, and his cab driver was waiting for his fare, too. 
He is the sublimated essence of butt-in, the refined intrinsic extract of rubber, the concentrated, purified, irrefutable, unavoidable spirit of curiosity and inquisitiveness. A new sensation is the breath in his nostrils. When his experience is exhausted, he explores new fields with the indefatigability of a— Excuse me, I interrupted, but can you produce one of this type? It is a new thing to me. I must study it. I will search the town over until I find one. Its habitat must be here on Broadway. I am about to dine here, said my friend. Come inside, and if there is a man about town present— I will point him out to you. I know most of the regular patrons here. I am not dining yet, I said to him. You will excuse me. I am going to find my man about town this night if I have to rake New York from the Battery to Little Coney Island. I left the hotel and walked down Broadway. The pursuit of my type gave a pleasant savor of life and interest to the air I breathed. I was so glad to be in a city so great, so complex and diversified. Leisurely, and with something of an air, I strolled along with my heart expanding at the thought that I was a citizen of great Gotham, a sharer in its magnificence and pleasures, a partaker in its glory and prestige. I turned to cross the street. I heard something buzz like a bee, and then I took a long, pleasant ride with Santos Dumont. When I opened my eyes I remembered a smell of gasoline, and I said aloud, uh, Hasn't it passed yet? A hospital nurse laid a hand that was not particularly soft upon my brow that was not at all fevered. A young doctor came along, grinned, and handed me a morning newspaper. "'Want to see how it happened?' he asked cheerily. I read the article. Its headlines began where I heard the buzzing leave off the night before. It closed with these lines. "'Bellevue Hospital, where it was said that his injuries were not serious. He appeared to be a typical man about town.' End of Man About Town